Diana Heapy, welcome back to Criminal Justice 203 here at Sitting Bull College, our undergraduate interview and interrogation course. I'm your instructor, Kara Damari Amachiapi. Today, we are going to be talking about interviewing children. This comes on the heels of last week's class where we looked at victim and trauma-informed interview styles and techniques. And I suspect that you will find some similar ideas behind looking at interviewing children. Not that this is the same type of interviewing as with victims, but that there are certain, not necessarily we might call trauma-informed techniques like we did with victims, but certainly certain child-informed, for lack of a better term, techniques that we are going to be looking at uh, to make the interview the most successful interview it can be. Now, let's pause for a second and think about why we might be interviewing children. Why we might be interviewing children. The first thing that may come to mind is that the child has potentially committed a crime, right? Um, so while that is certainly one potential reason, I think that especially given the range of professions, it sounds like students in this class are interested in pursuing, it is more likely uh, it be another reason that you end up perhaps in a interviewing situation with a child. And so what other reasons may there be that you might be interviewing children? Okay, so I might assume you thought about, oh, what if the child witnessed something? Again, we have talked about witness interviewing, eyewitness interviewing, and that goes a little bit along with the victim interviewing we talked about. That's certainly a possibility. Uh, what types of things might the child witness? Well, unfortunately, if you're in my criminology course as well, as we looked at the statistics last week, the most common perpetrators of crimes against children are parents and guardians of those children, unfortunately. And so one serious potential issue you might be interviewing a child about is abuse. So today we will be talking about child abuse. If that brings up anything for anyone, please feel free to let me know and I can find you an alternate assignment, but uh, otherwise we will talk about that in the context of interviewing children today. Other reasons for child interviews might be if you're working with child placement services or child protection services or another group who is either looking to change the housing of a child due to parental issues or potentially determine the best placement for a child in a situation of divorce or other situation where the child uh, can no longer stay where they were previously or might not be able to stay where they were previously. So in looking at interviewing children today, we will be at first going over some basics. We'll be then looking at some resources. We always try in this course to look to resources that you all can find when you're out there working in the field. This is less of a hands-on course than I might want it to be, but providing you with the resources to find your own information going forward uh, similarly to what we did in looking at eyewitness interviews, for example, working through procedures, we're going to be doing a little bit of that today. We are going to be looking at uh, specifically interviewing children through the lens of a court appointed special advocate. We're going to be looking at some of the work of Rosemary Vasquez, who's a licensed clinical social worker and the techniques that she's put together. We'll be reviewing a couple checklists. We like our checklists here in CJ203 in terms of if you get in a situation, something you can have in hand to make sure you are covering your bases or trying to. Uh, and yeah, so it should, be, it should be a great class and I appreciate you tuning in. So starting out, Let's think about uh, child interviews. Thinking of your experience uh, or your potential experience as say a police officer um, or a person working for CPS or 
a person working for child support enforcement or a person working for the courts. What would the differences be between interviewing a child and interviewing an adult? Okay, you might say that children haven't completed their development, that they have a different conception of time than adults. Uh, they may not understand the urgency of a situation, that they think differently from adults, right? That they understand situations and events differently based on where they are at in development, their maturity, other characteristics they have. Um, you might look at not only their age, but their gender, their ethnic origin, their culture, etc. They might communicate differently from adults, right? That's something that might make interviewing children different from interviewing adults. They could get scared or intimidated, right? Not that adults can't, but maybe it's more likely in the situation of a child. Uh, and in particular, victims, child victims, risk being further distressed when having to relate what happened to them. Oftentimes, this may be the situation with adults as well, but with children, it's really hard to form that cognitive dissonance or whatever, protective barrier. Uh, and it might be a pretty distressing thing to have to recall information for an interview. Let's be clear that child-friendly interview techniques are specialized techni techniques, okay? Uh, and they are different than adult interviewing techniques. So if you are, if all you have is an adult interview procedure, at whichever agency you end up at or other organization, think, okay, well, this gives me maybe a structure, but I really need to think about this from how a child understands things. Uh, the main goal in interviewing children, the first, the first and the primary priority is to do no harm to any child, right? To avoid, attitudes or comments or any kind of pejorative questions that could be insensitive or that could place the child in danger or expose the child to humiliation that could reactivate the child's pain from the traumatic events, all right? Don't do anything in any sort of discriminatory manner which would increase the, the feeling of the child that they were socially excluded based on their sex, their race, their age, their religion, uh, their educational background, their physical abilities, etc. cetera. Uh, another thing which might be a little bit less obvious is don't ask the child to tell a story or express something in a way which isn't how it actually happened. Uh, by that, I mean the type of analogizing that adults may be able to do, this might not be something within the repertoire of children. It's important to have a need to know basis in child interviewing, to really focus on the key data for the investigation, getting those details uh, and otherwise reduce these risks of re-victimization or other kinds of recreating a traumatic experience for the child. We also, and we'll talk about this more throughout the course today or the class today, we want to make sure that uh, the child or the child's parent or guardian knows that the child is being interviewed. If it's a situation that calls for that, there are certain abuse instances where there might be some slight changes to that, uh, but it's important to always explain the purpose of the interview um, to both the child and the parent or guardian uh, and its intended use and to get consent as well from the child and from their guardian uh, for all interviews and video recordings. So make sure to do those things. Also, in particular with children, it's important that you go out of your way to make sure of the confidentiality of what they're telling you of their testimony. Limit the number of people doing conducting the interviews. Uh, make sure that the children are comfortable and able to tell their stories without any pressure, including from you as the interviewer. All right, let's actually let's stick on this just for another second. Um, I want to talk about. Maybe we'll make a new slide here.
I want to talk about what are generally considered uh, and which have been summarized in the UN Guide for Interviewing Children, among other places. I'll put the link to that down here too. Let's see. As the six rules of a good interview. Okay. Um, the first is similar to interviewing that we talk about with eyewitnesses, with victims, and with others, even with perpetrators, it's create trust, right? Why do you want to create trust? Well, the way you as a police officer, as a CPS worker, interact with the child has a direct impact on how that child is going to respond, how they're going to react to questions. Part of creating trust is introducing yourself, saying what your role is, what your mission is, explaining the process fully. At first, the child might not be comfortable. They might not want to volunteer information, especially if you're behaving aggressively as an officer or if they're, they've had previous experiences like that. Uh, a child, however, might be more willing to discuss freely the circumstances of what's, what's taken place with an officer who or another agent who creates a climate of trust, all right? To effectively communicate with the child, therefore, it's crucial to first establish this good relationship to build that trust. That can be done verbally and non-verbally. Uh, for example, if you take time to discuss matters that aren't related to the situation that the child's in, like, does the child play any sports? What's going on at the child's school? What games is the child interested in? Creating trust that way. Like when we talked about interviewing victims and eyewitnesses, you know, at first just creating that trust. We saw that in that early video of the interview turned interrogation, right, of the young male suspect. Um, he wasn't a child, but their officer in that case uh, did take a fairly paternal role and created trust, if you remember that video interview. So the child needs to understand the situation. They need to understand why they're being interviewed, what the information is going to be used for. And so it's necessary as the person conducting the interview to explain that and under make sure that they understand, all right? Um, one thing that has seemed to be beneficial uh, and this is not the case in all situations or is not the is not necessarily uh, correct for all situations but oftentimes if the police officer or other interviewer is the same gender as the child uh, that might create uh, more feelings of trust so that's something to be aware of or if they have other similar characteristics to the child uh, that may provide the child with some default uh, feelings of trust or have the child be able to see themselves in them or whatnot. So think about that too. That's a good reason why you do want a range of diverse individuals working in agencies like uh, Child Protective Services, right? Or Department of Health and Human Services, because you want children to be able to see themselves in those people that they're talking to and feel comfortable and maybe have more immediate trust like that. The second part is um, create environment, right? And what do we mean by that? Well, we can, again, think back to what we've talked about in terms of talking to witnesses and victims. You want a interview in a safe environment, in a non-threatening environment, no weapons, quiet, private, no interruptions, no one able to walk in while the child's being interviewed. Uh, if you're conducting the interview, you shouldn't be accepting phone calls, walking in and out of the room. You should meet the child at eye level if you can. Be beside or in front of the child, not standing and looking down at them, all right? It's good to make sure just with, like with other interviewees, that if they need some food or some water or to use the toilet or anything else, that their basic needs are met first. Because if they aren't able to 
have their basic needs met, it's unlikely they might be able to participate effectively in the interview. And those kinds of things build trust as well. The third rule we're gonna talk about broadly today uh, is, and again, this echoes what we've talked about with other interviews, is uh, keeping an open mind uh, and staying objective, all right? And we know what keeping an open mind sounds like, right? It means listening to the child. We know from other interview techniques that having broad open-ended questions work well. And those may or may not work well with children, but it's important that the child is viewed objectively without stereotypes and prejudice and that the child uh, is able to say things and have them heard uh, by an interviewer who has an open mind and isn't physically or verbally uh, expressing something to the child in disagreement with what they're saying, all right? So don't necessarily form a first impression about the child that you're interviewing, all right? Uh, the child's attitude at first might be misleading, the child's clothes or whatever might be misleading. You'll remember from talking about victims, one of the videos that we watched discussed how sometimes victims don't even say they're victims, right? Or they act standoffish or they're other or they're un, like unusually calm and it feels weird because something traumatic has just happened to them. And it won't be exactly the same with children, but it's kind of important to expect the unexpected in that sense. All right. Number four, no surprise here, maintain that professionalism. All right, you might want to immediately step in and become the mother of this child and just treat them like that. You might want to otherwise engage with them like you might engage with your own child. But in order for the structure to stay solid of this interview, there needs to be that level of respect and those boundaries. Um, if you're a police officer, you need to show empathy to the child. You need to remain patient, allow the child time to fully answer questions. Children, let's remember, don't have necessarily the same sense of time as adults. They might not understand why questions need to be answered quickly. They might not know why certain details are important. Uh, this is especially the case with children who are younger. And so as the interviewer, you want to show that you're interested. You don't want to be compelling the child. You don't want to be stepping in and providing some false sense of something else for the child, but you want them to feel safe in a structured environment and as though they are being listened to. And so with that, we get into good listening. All right. And this is something that doesn't, might not immediately come to mind when you think of what is necessary for interviewing a child. And in fact, children are astutely aware sometimes of whether or not they are being interviewed, or I'm sorry, whether or not they're being listened to, I should say, uh, and heard, or whether someone is finding them unbelievable or boring or uninteresting or is patronizing them right? Children are aware of that. And so become an active listener. And if you need more advice on how to do that, there are plenty of available resources. That's a good skill in any interviews that we talk about, but also, or in most interviews, maybe not in some of the interrogations that we get into that, that changes a little bit. But uh, being a good listener is a skill across the rest of your life, right? And using active listening techniques, that means engaging in conversation with the child um, as they are expressing how they're feeling. It doesn't mean interrupting them, but it means being on that level with them as they move through what happened. If they feel like you are listening and that you are interested, the child's gonna communicate much more easily. They're gonna talk more freely. Don't interrupt them again. Uh, and it's also important to We've talked about this with other interviews. I haven't mentioned this yet today, I don't think. Uh, but you're going to be wanting to be recording the interview if all, at all possible. You can take notes too, uh, but sometimes that's a little bit 
uh, it can sense, it can be a little bit of an interruption. Also, if the child's not a reader, if they're not writing yet, it might uh, change their degree of trust potentially. Having some sort of, ideally in all these situations, video interviews, but at least an audio recording may be the best way to properly interview the child. Uh, and so that you can go back later on and rewatch that as necessary, okay? Do leave time during the interview, and this is part of being an active listener, uh, for the child to be silent. And what I mean by that is being an active listener doesn't mean that you're actively constantly questioning the child. Being an active listener means that you're there with them present and you're paying attention to what they're saying. But if they're going to take a second to think about how they're going to say something, if they're going to take a second to think back about what happened, provide them with that space, provide them with silence that they're able to talk. Don't force them to talk, right? Um, let them get there and let them tell you what happened. Uh, lastly, let's talk about positive conclusions. And by this, I mean, when you are concluding the interview, make sure that you've covered everything you intended to. Ask, just like you would with any other interviewee, if there's anything else they want to add. Let them know what's coming next. Thank them, just again, like you would with an adult. Thank them for their help. Don't raise their expectations. Don't give them that false hope. We talked about this a second ago. Don't, you're not stepping in as some sort of relative, right? Don't give them false hope of even any kind of continued relationship with you uh, or promise things that you can't deliver, but do let them know that they're appreciated, that they did a good job uh, with their interview. So let's move on. Let's actually talk a little bit also about verbal and nonverbal communication. So verbal. So I don't know if any of you pay attention to grammar, but uh, dashes are kind of out. So I'm not sure if people use dashes anymore. I think we're gonna use one there. But, all right, so, Let's start with actually verbal. So with verbal techniques, uh, we want to use short, simple sentences, right? We want to avoid long, complicated sentences with several ideas. So we want them to be short, simple uh, sentences, right? We want to have positive sentences. So we don't want to be, uh, and that simply means children might be thrown off a little bit if you use, and adults can be too, right? If you use words like didn't or wouldn't or haven't. Um, didn't you know, for example, that creates a little bit of a potential for confusion, not just among children, but among some adults. Uh, so you want to use things in the affirmative, we'll say. And an example of that would be, did, did you plan to go out with this person? Did you know that you were going to the store? Okay, not necessarily, didn't you know that you were going to the store? Didn't they, they tell you not to go out with this person? Make it simple, use sort of affirmative, sentences, not affirmative in the sense that you're trying to get them to agree, but just in that you're not uh, necessarily putting in a negative. Um, use neutral sentences. And neutrality is something that we talk about in other interviews too, but avoiding suggestive questions, avoiding double meaning questions. Make it simple. Why did you go to the store? Not didn't you go to the store to steal a candy bar, okay? Uh, and that goes also to not appearing to be judgmental or confrontational, all right? That goes all toward that sort of neutrality. Do that active listening again. And so that is a verbal, that is a verbal skill 
where you are walking the child along, uh, not leading them, but showing them that you're alongside them by agreeing with them or maybe not necessarily agreeing, but actively participating and responding to them. If you have to repeat a question, repeat it the same way. So repeat questions same way. Don't try to, or don't assume that the child didn't understand it and you need to rephrase it. Just give them a second to work it out, all right? Uh, you, you might have to eventually uh, use different words or something like that, but you want to, you want to not assume that the child uh, needs any more suggestion within the context of the question. You don't need to lead them in one direction or another. If they can't understand the question, then you can rephrase it, I guess, but just do it in such a way that, again, it remains neutral, that it remains objective. Uh, and make sure that if, if the child is being frustrating or if you're getting frustrated with the child, more likely, uh, not putting a child in a place of fear, not putting a child in a place where they may shut down. Um, so keeping a safe environment, even if the child is acting obstructively, don't raise your voice, don't shout, don't... Uh, push at the child in ways that don't actually benefit your case. If you don't need to know something, you don't necessarily need to push into it. So let's look at now some nonverbal. Actually, we'll leave that up there. Nonverbal communication techniques in child interviewing might be Visual contact. And so visual contact doesn't need to be staring in the eyes of the child the whole time. And certainly, depending on your culture and depending, like in Lakota culture, on your gender, that might not be an appropriate thing. That might not be something they're useful. But if you are able to occasionally, you know, create that trust with those, with that eye to eye connection, that might that might benefit you. Again, uh, we talked about this before, but sitting at child's level, don't be standing over them. Don't be pacing around, looking down at them. Avoid imitation that way. Uh, so let's talk about some things to avoid. So you're gonna avoid imitation, um, intimidation. Oh my goodness, intimidation mentioned, but also um, we talked about avoid, uh, avoid touching and being too close. And why is that? Well, depends on what you're interviewing them for, for one, right? If a child's had some sort of sexual abuse, that might trigger something within the child, for lack of a better word. Um, but also you are trying to create this very structured environment. And when you create a false sense of security for the child and then rip that away, uh, ending the interview, that's not necessarily gonna be good for the child or help out in future communications with that child, but also um, having that structure may actually create a safer space than uh, being physically close to them may, you know, and that's not something that's necessarily obvious, but, for people to be able to, and, and children especially, be able to trust in the boundaries that are, that are created and trust that you're someone that follows boundaries, that might give them a greater sense of security, especially when they've been around somebody who doesn't uh, have such good boundaries, right? So other nonverbal communications, um, keeping calm, all right? maintaining a calm demeanor. Don't show annoyance, don't show impatience. Don't be looking at your watch, don't be raising your eyebrows, don't be frowning, all right? Be calm, again, that sense of security. Uh,
know the child's nonverbal behaviors. What are they doing? What are their communications? How are they sitting? How are they looking at you? Are they uncomfortable? How can you make them more comfortable? Are, they, are there particular topics which really appear to raise something within them? Okay, uh, be aware of what they're doing. Another sort of nonverbal thing is just keeping the interview short. Children can't sit for hours and hours and hours, right? Um, we might, again, look at uh, in finding an interviewer that the child can see themselves in. So whether that be of the same gender or of same culture or otherwise uh, even of the same sort of personality type or disposition or whatever that the child can see themselves in. It may be that your child likes to tell jokes or whatever and you have an officer who you work with who's really good at, at you know, child level jokes and the two of them can bond in that way that they can see themselves in that behavior and therefore you have that trust, right? Um, just some more things to avoid. Avoid anything that, uh, so avoid behavior that suggests you don't care or aren't. This is just to rehash that. Don't pretend that you're that you're paying attention, but not be because the child will pick up on that. Uh, don't act like you don't take the child seriously. Don't be texting. Don't be taking phone calls. Don't be letting other people interrupt you or the child's space. All right. Again, pretty basics uh, for nonverbal communications. All right. So let's pause there with going through some of this initial data. And let's begin to look at resources, resources that are available uh, in this area and other resources that are available online. And part of how we do this in this class is we actually go to the resources and we'll look through them. And I want you to feel comfortable with these skills. If you have a question about something, and really these are skills that go far past criminal justice. If you are trying to understand something, if you are in a situation in law enforcement where you recognize that there probably is a procedure or policy in place for, for some sort of situation that's going on somewhere, uh, look for it, okay? Look for it, read it over. One of the skills that I'm concerned about some students in some of my classes having is the ability to uh, read and uh, uh, not comprehend, but put into, I don't know, uh, sort of, I don't have a great way of phrasing this, but uh, create examples within reality for themselves to see these things happening. And, and again, that's a poor way of phrasing this, but occasionally I'll put questions on quizzes and uh, in other assignments and other classes, and I'll receive response that shows that the person didn't read the question, right? Didn't fully engage with what was going on there. And sometimes it's because I've worded the questions poorly, but sometimes there's really distinct things within the questions and uh, that person is maybe in their own head a little bit when they're reading the questions. So I want, when you look at these resources from these states and other agencies, I want you to be able to review them with the type of reading that actually puts you in the shoes of the writer, puts you in the shoes of the agency or organization that is trying to convey whatever they're trying to convey to you. And so you're gonna have to step outside of your head a little bit if you if you don't tend to do that with you when you read um, and really look for what they're, what they're going for, what message they are trying to share. So there certainly are different types of interviews as we discussed, and each state might have various procedures already in place and uh, might tell you when interviews are required. If you look to the South Dakota Guide for Judicial 
process in child abuse and neglect cases. Uh, you'll note, and I don't know if I've got that pulled up here or can, uh, there you go. But if you look for interviews within this framework, you'll note that uh, one, one situation is uh, where you might be interviewing a child and uh, you might be interviewing them without the presence of their parent or guardian or without advance notice or consent. And so just familiarizing yourself uh, in whichever jurisdiction you're operating in, you know, which immunities from liability are possible for you under which circumstances, for example, uh, what mandatory reporters are required to do or not required to do. And those are generally pretty jurisdictionally specific uh, uh, things. There are some that we might consider almost all jurisdictions have incorporated, but you know, looking to that within, uh, within the area in which you're working. If you are operating as the child's attorney or if you're in tribal court operating in some sort of lay advocate capacity, um, here in South Dakota, if you're operating as a child's attorney, uh, you might need to be interviewing the child regularly as part of communicating with that child, right? Um, or their parents, you might be interviewing their parents or their family services specialists, et cetera. Uh, you might also be interviewing prospective witnesses prior to hearings. Uh, interviewers of parents by family services specialists or others may be admit, or interviews of parents might be admitted as evidence. And so when we talk about, and that gets more into our eyewitnesses um, or even our uh, perpetrator interviews, but recognizing that in some cases, there are some evidential issues there. So you can find within the South Dakota uh, guidelines for judicial process, whether that be a ch uh, child abuse and neglect or other judicial processes, processes uh, you can find examples and explanations of when to be using this type of interviewing. I wanna change speed for a second and direct us to this short video uh, put out about the Child Advocacy Center in South Dakota, which works with law enforcement, but who specialize in interviewing. So let's pause for a second and just watch this. This is out of uh, News Center One. I believe there's a video we can watch on here. Give it a second, even though I'm not. Oh, in class, I still have to get on the Let me pause that for a second. Uh, all right, here we go. The Center provides forensic interviews and arranges for specialized medical examinations when necessary. There are currently three forensic interviewers at CAC. We're specifically trained to interview children. That's what we do all day, every day. And it's a specific type of interview that is meant to reduce the trauma. It's developmentally appropriate for the child sitting in front of us. And we interview children ages 3 to 18, but can also interview adults that might have developmental needs that require a specific set of interview skills. A forensic interview is non-leading and non-suggestive and gives a child a safe and healthy way to share what they know about traumatic experiences. We are trained to ask questions in a very specific way so that our team, being law enforcement or child protection, can either prove or refute what the child is saying as part of a collaborative in investigative approach. The Child Advocacy Center works closely with Rapid City Police Department and Pennington County Sheriff's Office, but they also work with the surrounding counties in Western South Dakota. For the Pennington County Sheriff's Office, expert forensic interviewers are the best way to deal with victims of sexual and physical abuse. Science and technology and experience taught us we, we can't have um, street deputies interviewing young people trying to get stories out of them. That's not our strength. No, we, can, we can interview people and get stories out of people, but when you want an unsolicited answer um, from a very young person or, or a, a older person with developmental disabilities, 
you need an expert to talk to them and let them tell their story their way. The sheriff's office says by working with the Child Advocacy Center, it's able to get more accurate results in a safe and healthy way without taking deputies away from their patrol duties. In Rapid City, Jeremy Gutierrez, News Center One. All right, so that gives a little bit of a sense and hopefully brings some of this home into why this type of interviewing is important and where it is used. This might also be something that you're interested in doing. This might be a type of uh, criminal justice related profession where you'd like to be working with the Child Advocacy Center or in that type of role with another department or agency. And so these are serious skills, okay? With that, I'll note, uh, just like in our eyewitness interviews and the other interviewing we've been looking at, there are a range of already available procedures for doing interviews of uh, juveniles, uh, whether that be in a police capacity or whether that be, and by police capacity, I mean whether that be in a situation where the, the juvenile or the child is, is accused of something or whether that be in a situation where they are uh, witnessing something or did witness something or talking about something like that. Let me share this new screen here. So we've, what we've got here is an example from the Sioux Falls Police Department, and this is uh, publicly available uh, and provided from the department on, online. And it's a juvenile investigations procedure, all right? And it works through what to do in a juvenile investigation. But you'll note that uh, immediately within this document is under the procedure are special considerations that have to do with children and that it notes for the most part officers need to contact the parent or guardian of a juvenile prior to interviewing or interrogating that juvenile. So just little things like that. If you are engaging in a interview with a child looking uh, and it is some sort of, uh, especially if it is some situation where the child might be a child perpetrator, child delinquent, looking and noting any special considerations for working with children and looking at other uh, procedures that might be around, whether that be like we looked at New Orleans and we looked at Wichita, Kansas, I believe, and we were talking about other police department procedures for interviewing. And you can find these type of procedures even in your general area, like Sioux Falls might be for here, right? And so looking and seeing what's done around, around where you're at uh, and in other places. Another thing that especially uh, related to child abuse states have been very good at is creating uh, information and or advocacy centers within the states have been good at creating information about these types of interviews. And so North Dakota, for example, has a great brochure about forensic interviewing. It talks about how this is a structured, developmentally sensitive conversation with a child looking to elicit conversation. It talks about making a referral um, to their team, to the child's children's advocacy center. Uh, and that process. You might be requesting, so we saw the South Dakota Children's Advocacy Center, I don't recall if that was the exact name of it, um, the Child Advocacy Center in South Dakota. And in North Dakota, we've got the uh, Children's Advocacy Centers, um, part of the National Children's Alliance. And so if you are a member of law enforcement, if you're a member of social services, if you're a member of a prosecution, and you don't have specialized training. And I don't mean, do not be considering this class specialized training, all right? If you wanna pursue this further and you wanna be doing this on the regular, you're gonna need some probably specialized training. If you don't have that training, but you can kind of remember, oh yeah, I remember in my interview and interrogations class, we learned that especially for children, you might want to work with uh, advocacy centers which are trained to work with children and which are set up, which have environments actually wholly based. We haven't. I don't think I have any slides that show the insides of some of these offices, 
but they're meant for children, right? They're set up to be comfortable environments. So if you've got a situation of, of sex, sexual abuse, if you've got a situation of physical abuse, of neglect, of domestic violence, or if a child has witnessed a crime, consider contacting one of these advocacy centers and having them conduct the interview, right? Um, I, some things, uh, if, if you're a parent and you have questions, they provide you with some do's and don'ts. Do tell the child about their appointment, tell them to speak the truth, etc. Don't uh, offer them bribe to, to tell what happened or tell them they're going to play or lie to them in any other way. Uh, so just some nice guides and you see here some resources within North Dakota, the Dakota Children's Advocacy Center in Bismarck, in Minot, the Northern Plains Children's Advocacy Center, in Fargo, the Red River Children's Advocacy Center. So uh, perpetrators or alleged perpetrators are not allowed within these centers. Uh, if they do accompany the victim to the center, uh, law enforcement might ask them to leave or will ask them to leave. They work on not tricking or coercing child children into incriminating themselves. Uh, they do do recordings at these centers. And so again, recognizing that these resources are available within your community to, to go along with that even further, I'll note that the North Dakota Child Protection Services Manual, which you can find a copy of at nd.gov, the North Dakota state site, has within it multiple procedures for working with interviewing children or things to uh, remember. So if you want to just go to that document, if you happen to be conducting an interview with a child, um, this is all about children, this ch Child Protective Services Manual. Um, you might go down and look into uh, the different interviews, uh, looking at the location, looking at the sequence, all right, and they provide you with that information and more uh, in interviewing requirements, I think that's another section. Let's see here. Um, looking at other requirements for interviews. And this is in the Child Protection Services Manual. So if you end up working in Child Protection Services for the state of North Dakota, you have a manual which has some information on interviewing children already, already in it. Make sure to refer to it. Likewise, if you end up working for Child Protection Services for a tribe, for Standing Rock or for some other tribe, look to your manual. Look to see what you're supposed to do in interviews with child. And this isn't like, look while the interview is going on. This is like when you're doing your prep and we talked about the necessity of prepping for these interviews. When you're doing your prep, uh, having made sure that you're following all necessary requirements. And if you're working for a tribe that doesn't have uh, interview information within its policies and procedures already, uh, and you're working in some sort of child services capacity, consider asking your supervisor if this is something that can be included, if you can work to develop this, or if you can uh, look to another tribe or a state or a federal uh, it, set of information about doing this, just so that it is standardized within your agency or department, uh, and that you're using, hopefully, what have been shown to be some of the more effective techniques in doing this. Uh, I'll mention also that there is a, uh, this is just another state, this is out of Florida. Florida has a whole six page procedure uh, in their uh, child welfare operating procedures that go through. You can see this is a little bit different than North Dakota's, right? It's, it's actually a lot more complex, but it takes you through one step at a time, takes you through the documentation, uh, takes you through um, any sort of supervisor consultation that's necessary. It takes you through step by step um, some of the actual conducting of the interview, right? These procedures, present identification, inform them, encourage them, et cetera, right? So if you can't find it, like if you've looked to the North Dakota uh, state information, if you've looked to the North Dakota Child Protective Services Manual and you're finding little information, or if you've looked to a tribe, look to another state, just see what they've incorporated. And while not all of those things might be applicable within your jurisdiction, uh, generally the structure might be one that has been tested and otherwise uh, found to be effective. So 
definitely feel free to look to other resources. Uh, additionally, there are organizations that have created practice guidelines. So this is one example. I don't know if I have this set to be able to pull up here. This is the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, and they actually have a whole set of practice guidelines. You don't have to be a member to access those guidelines, but you do have to fill out uh, basic information and submit it. Just put in your name, your last name, your email address if you're working for an organization, you know, and this is part of your work, that email address, and then you can access their practice guidelines. Uh, this is a group that, especially if you're dealing with abuse situations, uh, is, is, is strongly focused on that. So that's a good place to start for that. I'll mention also that there are resources related to interviewing Native children specifically, all right? And uh, this is one that's created for, I don't know if it'll redirect, I think it opens up a separate uh, PDF or doc, Word doc, I guess. Interviewing, in this case, particularly in sexual abuse situations, but if you're working with a specific uh, group, you know, there might be information related to that type of interviewing. If you're working with children in an urban environment, children in a rural environment, native children, uh, children uh, of immigrants, children of other cultures, children, and I shouldn't say other cultures, but children of a specific culture, there might be something. If you're interviewing rich children, there might be something on that, I'm not sure. Uh, but if you be aware that there are lots of pieces of available information out there. And one of these pieces of available information is by uh, the court appointed special advocates of Arizona. And I'm going to focus on this one today because this group actually allows uh, a certification. And so this week we don't have a quiz in this class. And instead of a quiz, I invite you to seek certification. It's, it's free uh, from court appointed special advocates of Arizona, which has an online course. And so we're gonna work through a little bit of that course together. I'm gonna to show you how you can take its quiz to potentially get your own certification. And if you would like to do that, that might be something which you could use on your resume or otherwise uh, might help you in knowing what to do foremost in these types of interviews going forward, but also in creating a, a basis for your knowledge, which you can show, uh, which includes not just courses here, but uh, certificates gained through other programs. So check out, this is on the Arizona Courts website, actually. And if you go to Arizona or azcourts.gov slash CASA, CASA, CASA slash training, um, within the training courses, uh, you can find uh, training on interviewing children. Hence, right down there, interviewing children. Okay, and so we are going to be working through a little bit of that today. And that training is created by Rosemary Vasquez, who I mentioned at the beginning, uh, is a licensed clinical social worker. And so we're going to be using a lot of their language. And then, if you'd like to continue through their training and seek a certification for yourself. I'll show you how to potentially do that. So in looking at interviewing children, sort of as an initial, let's call this the, okay. So we've got an introduction to interviewing children. Many clinicians, and we're gonna use the word clinicians here. This is same as police officers or other agency interviewers. It's a, we could also use, just use the word interviewers. Um, many interviewers use a play setting actually when they're interviewing children. Now again, these are we're, we're looking at this in the lens of uh, special advocates, and these are people who are advocating for the children within courts. But a play setting might work for a variety of children. Okay, and the first step in starting an interview is determining the purpose of the interview, helping the ch not only yourself determine the purpose, which you should do ahead of time and prepare, uh, but being clear. And part of what they recommend in this step 
uh, CASA does is making a list of any potential biases you might have about the child's life. Thinking about what you know and feel about the situation prior to starting the interviews, that might actually help you uh, prevent those biases from impacting your judgment. Next, looking to learn from the individuals. Uh, you might learn about the individuals, I should say, is you might be able to talk to the parents ahead of time. You might get a little bit of the child's history, or you might be able to talk the, to the child's guardian. And that way, you might be able to set up an interview, which is more structured toward obtaining that information, uh, because you already know a little bit about the child. If you have specific things you know about the child as you start, bringing those up, creating that bond with the child, that trust like we talked about before, reducing the child's anxiety level. You might talk about their school. The child might start explaining things to you. They might start exploring things with you. And then you might be able to actually ask the child some questions about what's going on. In the interview setting, this interview setting, you want, uh, you want on occasion to even conduct the interview within the child's home. If, that's, if it's not a situation where uh, the parent or guardian is the, the potential perpetrator, or if it is, but they are out of the picture, and you're able to, that might be a safe space for the child. Also, the child might wanna show off some of their toys or other things. Uh, it's helpful when you're creating a setting, whether even if it's not at the child's home, even if it's an inter interview room. And remember that uh, there are these advocate programs within the states that already have spaces set up for this. But if you're not in one of those places and you're not in the child's home, maybe you bring with you some toys, bring with you some paper um, for the child to draw on, bring with you some games, meet the child, have them tell you about themselves, show you around if you're in some place that they know, and then have them separated and begin to conduct the interview. Try to observe the child a little bit before you conduct the interview as well, just to get a sense of them, right? If there are certain things that you see that are making the child uncomfortable with uh, the situation, even before you begin the interview, maybe those are things you can remediate prior to starting. It's nice to have a setting that brings out the child's interests. If you have play materials that they can, they can be they have their minds kind of opened and be willing to to think about things or think about different things or explain things. You don't want there to be too many toys uh, and you don't want there to be too many extra things. And in fact, sometimes that can be extremely distracting, but you might want them to be able to draw out what they're talking about, for example, or use a toy to illustrate something. And so a couple toys might be helpful to have around. Uh, another thing that we might might want to do is well, use art. And so what do we mean by using art? Well, children might be able to draw, all right? There's depending on different developmental levels. And I don't mean children might be able to draw as in like, you know, being uh, Rembrandt or something but they might be able to express something on paper a little bit and that might be helpful for them. You don't want to necessarily assume what their drawings mean, but these are these types of nonverbal cues that we talked about. Uh, there are, there's a whole school of understanding related to children's drawings, but generally if you see some really disturbing drawings, that's something that you really want to make note of, right? If you've got drawings that have uh, people in various states of distress or, or scattered body parts or, uh, you know, limbs in, in uh, like removal of limbs or really dark skies, uh, you know, this, these might be things, and again, not for you to interpret, and this does, this course doesn't purport to teach you any of that, but for you to really, you know, keep and make note of, and maybe refer to someone who is good at, or who's trained at interpreting uh, child's drawing. So we'll also talk about, uh, I'm 
use using games. So there are a variety of games and they're dependent on the child's developmental level that are shown to be somewhat effective in interview type situations. One of these might be the draw yourself game, having the child draw a picture of themselves and say what they are thinking or feeling and looking at that picture and asking them what they're thinking and feeling. Uh, children who are eight and above might know how to play hangman, uh, which is, you know, I don't know if that's the most uh, correct game, but they, they might look at, uh, I, they might want to reveal a word through that method, right? Again, this is like, this is basically providing them with the opportunity to share things if they're not sharing things. Uh, they might want to play a little game of uh, trash bin basketball and just tossing things over into a waste basket, right? And having a little bit of fun that way. Ways to, ways to draw them out. You might have them do some sort of squiggle on a piece of paper. This was a specific game created by uh, this gentleman called D.W. Winnicott. D.W. Winnicott was a psychoanalyst and English pediatrician, and he looked into object, object relations theory and developmental psychology. Uh, and part of this idea is to just draw a squiggle on a piece of paper and whatever the child sort of says that is or where they take you from there when you say, what do you see in that? What is, what is that? What does that shape look like? Maybe that's a safe, non-threatening way of engaging with them. All right. Uh, one thing right off the bat is you want to make the child feel safe and you want to provide that level of confidentiality. When a child talks to you, uh, it might be that the court is the only one that you can relay that information to. And if so, you should let the child know that, all right? So you might not be required to inform the child's parents. If that's the case, you might let the child know that as too. You might not be required to talk to anyone else about what the child says to you. Of course, if it involves illegal activities or things that are potentially harmful to the child, that should probably be reported to Child Protective Services and you can look into your mandatory reporting statutes. Um, but creating that sense of safety for the child and letting them know, especially if they're talking about some sort of abuse that's happened to them uh, with someone that they know that what you're discussing is confidential and the extent to which that is the case. Uh, we'll talk about information synthesis, information synthesis. When you have been interviewing the child, you've been making notes, you've been recording it, now you've got to put it together. And this generally doesn't happen during the interview. At that point, you want to be present with the child, right? But this might happen afterward. And it's not as straightforward. We talked about with uh, victims, for example, that chronologically having them relay their stories is not, even though it might be easiest for you as the interviewer, isn't the easiest thing for them as the interviewee necessarily or the thing which is most likely to draw them out. Well, with children, it's even a whole nother level of difficult perhaps because they might be telling you things uh, not referring to themselves in the first person. They might be telling you things in a variety of different means. And afterward, you're gonna to try to synthesize this information. All right, uh, you want to be going through everything you learned, all the pictures, everything else that the child created during their time with you and putting it together almost as pieces of a puzzle, right? You're looking to put together a puzzle in such a way that it's accurate, um, but and that you can, for each piece, you can cite to a particular thing that the child said or did during the interview of verbal or non-verbal communication, uh, but creating a picture based on what you've learned. And so this isn't a chance for you to, you know, tell a story uh, that isn't true. It's a chance for you to reflect on everything and put it together in such a way which seems to make the most sense and which you can refer back to. All right, so we we've talked about this on and off, but let's talk about different stages of development. And from very young children, to 
older children, all right? So infants, we've got kind of an infant or a toddler picture here, but infants are, uh, they're not easy to interview. Um, there's a couple different, uh, they're, at least according to CASA and then uh, them citing a, this, this study by Chess and Thomas, three main types of infants you might be working with. They might be sort of easy inter inter infants that have regular sleeping patterns, regular feeding, positive attitudes, cry with reason most of the time. You might have slow to warm up infants who take a while to adjust uh, to new situations, um, don't necessarily adjust as easily. And then you might have what are considered more difficult infants, ones that cry a lot, don't have many regular patterns, don't have clear signals as to what they need, might get emotional more easy, um, might have certain sensitivities. Moving into toddlers, the toddler age, you might have children who are, uh, let's see here, now if we're gonna skip ahead. Um, yeah, so, so let's actually go back to, to infants for a second. Let's just talk about with infants, um, you can interview infants, obviously, right? But you might be able to observe them. You might be able to observe their reactions to strangers. You might be able to observe their eye contact. You might be able to check on their affect, check on if they seem apathetic, check on if they seem to be developing normally. And these might be things also that are reasons you would reach out to a child advocacy program who has specialists who are already trained in child development, or you might look to some sort of an expert. Uh, but one thing you might be able to assess more is the parent to child interaction. You might be able to see if the parent maintains a level of calmness with an infant, or if they're anxious, if they're frustrated. Uh, kind of get a sense in an interview with a child of that age of what the relationship is between the guardian or parent and that child. Moving into uh, so that's development, and we'll say that development. Infants. Uh, we're moving into sort of development for toddlers. For toddlers, and toddlers, we're talking about like two to five year olds. For two to five year olds, uh, children at that age are engaging with the world a little bit more, um, testing things out, trying to see what the, the boundaries of their autonomy are and yet still needing that security. It's hard to create structured play sometimes um, within children of that age group in terms of setting up uh, a situation for an interview. They might have difficulty not having uh, a parent in the room with them or guardian in the room with them. And so that might also be something that you want to kind of consider ahead of time or, or that you might have to uh, structure some other way. They might need a, a, that sense of security though. But with toddlers, uh, sometimes what works best is simply have a table with some figurines. So that might be little people, little houses, little animals, et cetera, and inviting them to play because you've got a lot of this imaginative, imaginative play in this play with sort of objects like that and see if they play with things in a certain way, right? They might not be at the drawing age yet, but they might be able to, if they're playing in a particularly aggressive way or in a way if they show something which uh, a typical child who hadn't undergone uh, something might not show within their actual playing, then that's something to make note of. That's something to, you know, have on your recording. When it's possible with these types, with these age group of children, two to five, you're gonna use your short and simple sentences that we talked about. What do you call, tell me about, etc. right? Use names, don't say he, don't say she, say Aunt Susie, Uncle Rick, whatever, okay? Um, child doesn't un understand something, try asking it a different way or just repeat it, say it again. Um, don't necessarily use time, children at this age aren't, always up to, up to, you know, ready to using time yet. Uh, they might not have very good verbal skills, but you might be able to 
recreate a certain situation or event to help bring back their memory if you can do it in a non-traumatic way. So one game with children of this game of this age might be uh, the telephone game where you have a two separate telephones and you're on one and they're on the other and they're just talking to you through the telephone which doesn't seem like it's out of this world but might actually be a way to get the child to talk to you. You might have a book which has a scenario similar to the one that the child might have gone through. Now you're not trying to leave the child but you might be able to ask them did you ever feel like this? What did you do when this happened, etc. right? Um, there's an, a game called the I Feel game, which Casa suggests it's a non-threatening game um, that children are sort of familiar with. In a paper bag, you put objects like a rock or a pencil or a ball, and you invite the children to put their hand in the bag and tell you what they feel. And uh, that's, that's a way to sort of start asking the child questions and building that rapport. Uh, there are some other suggested games for children of that age group, but I think you sort of get the hint. The next age group that we might talk about are 10 to 13 year olds. And this is where you have a lot more verbal abilities. This is sort of at early school into middle school. And so um, let's see if we can add, this is development. Uh, let's move her up here. I think this is development. 10 to 13. All right, so in this age group, you've got uh, feelings, right? You've got feelings of competence that are more evident. You've got a stronger sense of self. You've got a more clear uh, logical thinking ability. You've got the potential for that person to enjoy being challenged, um, to look at fairness. Fairness becomes a big issue in this age group. So when you're working with them, doing uh, games like, like a talk show game, like pretend they're being interviewed and tell them, what is their, your opinion of this? You know, what, is, uh, what do you think about the fact that, you know, and children are sometimes separated from their parents. You know, if, some, if you create a game, game show or talk show or interview, news interview type situation, maybe that would be fun or interesting for them. Another suggested type game is a guessing game where you can guess things about their life and they can tell you whether you're right or wrong. Maybe you start out with things that you know or know not to be the case uh, and then lead that into things that you're trying to ascertain. Uh, you might also be able to create some sort of debate where you go back and forth and you award points or they award points or something like that. So that level is maybe uh, you're starting to get into much easier level to interview um, and children with ideas of fairness already. So the next age group, and we talk about this more next week, uh, and I don't know if I have any good depictions of this this age group. I don't think I do here. Uh, just cute. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just... Clearly he is not a teenager, but uh, we'll look just at that picture for now. So in a teenage situation, there are potential conflicts, right? There are needs, there are people finding themselves and finding out what they need and finding out ways to protect themselves from pain. They can be very resistant to questioning. Uh, it might be very helpful in a situation like that to start off the interview with the teenager talking about themselves, creating rapport that way, talking about their classrooms, their friends, you know, whoever else and encouraging them to get used to discussing uh, themselves in a way that they're comfortable with. Then you might be able to bridge topics, but you've got to do so gingerly. You have to be aware that they know what, what you're there to find out potentially, right? And they might or might not feel comfortable with talking to you about it. And so rapport is so essential with teenagers. Evaluate them carefully. Try to distinguish between what might be normal adolescent independence and what might tend toward more withdrawal, right? What might in fact be some depression, some intense anger, 
etc. Now those are things for a psychologist or someone who's got a particular kind of training to be able to actually suss out. But these are things that you can make notes of in your interview in order to uh, look back on the context of this interview and also so that you can try to ascertain as much helpful information as possible. All right, so with that, uh, let me show you, let's go back to CASA for a second. Let me see here. So on the Arizona Courts webpage, azcourts.gov slash CASA slash training, uh, there is actually a final exam that you can take and get a certificate. And so they have these, CASA of Arizona is pleased to offer these training courses and exams. The exams are, exams are self-scoring, which means they score automatically. Um, and upon receiving a passing score of 75% or greater, a certificate will be available for you to either print or download along with your quiz results. So it notes that right the second, uh, the software sometimes is timing out before you can get a certificate. So maybe by the time you try this, uh, it will have changed, uh, but you can at least get the email or you can at least you know use that uh, percentage that you get to show that you pass this. Uh, and make note of that. This is, it's obviously a participation type of thing, um, but getting you a certificate from CASA of Arizona uh, that you might be able to use. If you happen to want to volunteer with them, you'd then email the certificate to your coordinator, but uh, these are actually cert certificates that are available for the public. And so under, under, so under the training courses, uh, you'll find that there is indeed one on interviewing children. There's also one on um, ICWA, actually, if you're interested in pursuing that, or Munchausen syndrome by proxy, or these other things. And so if you'd like a, a type of potential certification in that, you can go to, go up to one of those. But uh, once you click on interviewing children, it will then bring you through a exam and you go through, you pick, you select, but actually before you get to this stage, and I don't know why I didn't show it here, I think I'm logged in, before you get to the stage, you will have to register and you register and you just put in your name and your email address. You can use your SBC email, email address and you'll get an email and you'll have to click on that link uh, and you'll uh, then have to, you know, you can create a password um, and log in and then you're able to go back and get into this. So go ahead and give that a try and work your way through these quizzes, you know, read through them picked the best available option. And then uh, if you do well enough, and then if you don't, you can go back and retake it, I think. Um, but if you do well enough, you'll get in your email, uh, an email from CASA uh, saying that you either passed or didn't and effectively granting you that certificate um, uh, as part of this CASA for Arizona Court Appointed Special Advocates for Children. And so that's a, that's what, what's available this week in terms of if you'd like to do uh, a quiz and get yourself something which might be useful going forward and keep your eyes out for other opportunities like this. I don't know how long this will be available publicly or available to people in other locations, but use it while it's there. There might be other such things like this where you are at or in other parts of the country, check out um, potential available resources and you know, don't expect resources to come to you. Get outside the box and find yourself. If you want to be an expert in something, if you want to be an expert in child interviewing, then find yourself the child interviewing courses. Go to them, you know, stay on the straight and narrow and, you know, maybe, uh, or not maybe, but with a significant amount of work and, you know, by showing up to things and, by learning as much as you can, you can make yourself uh, somebody who has sort of special qualifications. So with that, I think we are done. Oh, no, I take that back. Let me show you there. There are also, we talk about this with other interviews. There's checklists out there for interviewing children. So uh, this is one, for example, it's available. You can go to uh, the Pennsylvania Child Welfare Training Program. Um, this is a handout that they had, and it's a checklist. Uh, I think I've got, oh, I've got a couple more. I've got another right here. 
uh, another checklist specifically with a sort of violation against the child. Um, the OJP, one of our favorite resources, uh, the Office of Justice Programs has an Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention that has a great, not, it's not really a brochure, but it's a, a booklet, 20 pages on uh, child forensic interviewing, uh, which goes through various techniques and considerations, some historical context, uh, trauma, things to consider before beginning the interview, uh, things to consider during the interview, building rapport, if you want some more information on how to build rapport, uh, various hypotheses within the actual interview, finishing the interview, uh, and then some interviewer tips. Let's just look through these briefly. We've got conduct the interview as soon as possible after the initial disclosure, record the interview electronically, hold the interview in a child safe environment or safe child friendly environment, He's open any questions throughout the interview. Uh, these are things that we've basically repeated time and again today and through much of our other types of interviewing, all right? Uh, ask the child to go describe his or her experience in detail and do not interrupt the child during this initial narrative account. All right, so if you need reminders of that or if you'd like more resources, this actually cites a lot of other resources you can check out too. Uh, as always, go to the OJP and they have those resources available. So with that, we will uh, close out for our interviewing children uh, section today. And again, you are encouraged to go to the CASA Arizona website. I think I've got that up here still. To under training, you're gonna go over under training. Um, you're gonna go under training courses. You're going to go down to interviewing children, all right? And you can work your way through interviewing children. You'll see if we go back to that, actually, um, there's some more information available there, too. But uh, we've got this web. We've got a PDF and an MP3 version. In fact, you can actually, if you'd like to listen to... You are listening to the audio version of the Interviewing Children the audio version of the interviewing children. It's a really cool resources there. So go check that out and then complete that quiz uh, for interviewing children. And you'll actually get yourself to the level where you'll be eligible if you pass uh, for a certificate uh, from CASA of Arizona if they're, if they're able to download them today. If not, you'll, you'll probably get an email which will tell you your score, which you could potentially use to show that you had met that. You'll have to register beforehand, as I mentioned. So with that, thank you for joining me today and I look forward to the next time I see you.